Hi, I'm David Abram. Welcome to the Animate Earth Dialogues, a series of conversations between me and various curious human creatures, each of them powerfully engaged in transforming and deepening our human relation to the more than human Earth. This dialogue was recorded in February of 2019 near my home in northern New Mexico with the activist and author Charles Eisenstein. A wonderful man. I met him when uh, a few years ago I was uh, giving a workshop for three or four days in West Virginia and um, I would put a cap on the size of the workshop at 30 people and it filled up very quickly and I couldn't understand why? Because I'd never done anything in that part of the country. Um, and I called up the organizers and they said, well, um, Charles Eisenstein is coming with eight or nine of his assistants. And so he just signed all of them up. And I asked, who is Charles Eisenstein? They said, well, you'll see. Um, which I did. This remarkable cat who's a wonderful storyteller and a visionary thinker uh, came to the workshop and it was a pleasure to meet him and come to know his ideas and his thinking. He's the author of uh, several classic works, The Ascent of Humanity, Sacred Economics, uh, which contains his deepening reflections on gift economies. Um, his book, The More Beautiful World, Our Hearts, the more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. And most recently, just a few months ago, was released his new book, Climate, A New Story. And it's a darn fine piece of work. It is a new story for thinking about the wild contortions of climate change. So pick it up. But right now, I hope you enjoy our conversation. With this new book of yours, what, what tickled my toes was that for many years now I've been aching because, um, and, we ne and we needn't linger long on this, on this topic, but for many years I've been aching because climate change discourse um, and the whole, yeah, just the whole ferocious conversation uh, at large around climate change has muscled out of the picture almost every other um, important ecological issue, environmental issue, um, including biodiversity, um, including um, what's happening to the, to the waters and um, wetlands as they're being filled in, including, well, so many other uh, matters that we were all engaged with uh, for a long time have just all of the energy, the mana within them has been usurped almost right. like by this um, discourse around an issue that is so huge, global, and hence massively abstract, um, that is couched always in the most abstract terminology of statistics and parts per million carbon dioxide um, that for many people for a very long time it has been something that they can uh, glean um, intellectually but uh, a visceral felt sensorial sense of of this conundrum um, seems to have escaped many people until um, the trees are dying around their home or until uh, a, a wildfire is raging through the neighborhood um, or another flood. But I felt like I was barking up uh, uh, 
you know, not necessarily the wrong tree, but I was, I, w I was a lone voice mm -hmm. saying, hey, wait, we can't just only be speaking of climate change. Um, what about all of our felt concern for the world and the more than human earth immediately around us? Um, and here comes your book, Climate, A New Story, um, making that point in very extensive and beautifully thought through, beautifully felt and researched ways. And I am very grateful for that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what you were saying about it, how it muscles out other issues or, or kind of makes them subsidiary to climate change. Like they'll talk about biodiversity, but it'll be climate change is going to cause extinctions. They'll talk about, um, you know, water, water quality, and they'll say climate change is going to um, cause water shortages. Climate change is going to cause refugees. Right. Climate. So it basically invites us to solve every problem by addressing one problem. Mm. And that kind of reductionism really is reminiscent of money. It's the one thing that if you only had it, it would solve all your problems. Yes. So it's a very familiar way of thinking about the world. And, and what is especially alarming to me is that the things that it, it relegates to secondary status or leaves out entirely actually are the things that are the most important when you understand the planet in a different way as being a living organism. Yes. And then you realize that all those things like that, that call to your love actually are also crucial to planetary physiology. And, and that is not necessarily visible through the lens of carbon. The right. importance of whales or beavers or, or insects, mm. you know, like theoretically you could have a world with no whales, beavers or insects, but if you had carbon sucking machines, then you could have a perfectly healthy climate. And that's where a lot of the uh, energy and money is going actually is toward this reduced question, how do we cut carbon? How do we, yeah. Yeah, yeah if I might say, as you, as you point out, this looking for the single cause, which is such a propensity in the West, um, it also echoes, um, it, it echoes a kind of um, impulse that moves through the sciences often, but it's right there at, um, in our theological tradition, just this sense that, um, that God, blessed be he or she, um, creates the world by fiat in a single act of, mm. um, of generation, um, which is then echoed within even contemporary physics in the sense that everything comes from the Big Bang, right. which of course is a moment radically uh, outside of our direct experience, um, infinitely distant really in space and time. But then, you know, in other disciplines um, within the sciences, there's a sense that, uh, well, everything is really, all our behavior, all our experience is caused by the genes um, or by this single cause tucked inside the nucleus of ourselves, uh, the genome. Um, but across the campus in another building, they'll be saying, well, actually all our experience is really caused by these um, interconnections, the flooding uh, um, chemistry between the synapses and dendrites that are hidden behind our brows. But again, the synapses of our neurons, the genome uh, within the strands of DNA are radically transcendent to the world of our direct mm -hmm. felt experience. Um, so it's always looking for the one cause of the problems we encounter or the world we experience, and it's always outside of experience. Mm -hmm. It's in some hidden dimension, like a heaven that's hidden behind the scenes. Um, 
And it's a bit like that. This yeah, this is going to lead to one thing I wanted to talk to you about, um, uh. which is magic. Uh. Um, first, I want to say that I'm actually a fan of a world created by fiat in the sense of oh, really? a world spoken into existence, mm. but not by a single act of fiat, uh, but by uh, an ongoing story or an ongoing communication, mm. um, uh, a set of relationships that, that continually speaks more and more of the world and more and more life into existence through the interchange of of, I mean, it could be signaling molecules, aromatic compounds, words, concepts. Um, so I kind of like to embrace the generative power of, of what in the human world we would call speech. Mm. So yeah, not wanting to you know, discard fiat as, as in to speak something into existence. And to relate it to cosmology, like this single act of creation, the Big Bang. Mm. Um, I've spent a little time investigating alternative cos cosmologies, alternative scientific cosmologies, and there is there are uh, dissidents in the scientific world who do not accept oh, really? the Big Bang as a unitary act of creation, uh, especially like certain plasma physicists and and proponents of what they call the electron, the electric universe. Um, this Dutch astronomer, Halton Arp, who has a, basically he points out that the entire Big Bang and expanding universe theory all hinges on a specific interpretation of redshift, hmm. which says redshift is caused by recessional velocity only. Right. And he says, if you um, consider the possibility that redshift could also be caused by the aging of matter, then these quasars and things that seem to be receding at the speed of light and are very, very far away might actually be closer and younger. Hmm. Uh, I can't remember all the details, but basically it, it leads to a universe that is continually being born and not born in one burst of negative entropy and then winding down to heat death forever yes. after. So, so, you know, I think that our, our theories, our scientific theories, a lot of times they are reflections or projections of our own social circumstances. Sure. And, and the one, the kind of winding down to heat death, you know, entropy increasing forever uh, is consistent with a world that depends on the human imposition of force to maintain order. Mm. Otherwise, it's just going to all go to pot. Uh, not to denigrate pot, but you know what I mean. Yeah. Like otherwise, it's going to all go to chaos, and only the human being, the the, can can impose order on chaos. And this had a civilizational origin, you know, where the 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 king would be the one who imposes order on the world and so on and so forth. So interesting. It's lovely. I guess for me, the, the, the sense of a world created by fiat um, is, is the sense of a world created all at once uh, in a single act, a single cause, that big bang. Right. Um, uh, determined it all, you right. know, and it all unfurls from there, rather than what I hear you um, sort of leaning towards um, or trying to bend us towards is a sense of the radical relationality between ourselves, spiders, mycorrhizal fungi, um, aspen groves, and storm clouds that in the interactions between many different beings, uh, the countless 10,000 things really, are in their relations with one another, they're conducting their communications, interchanges. Um, the world is continually being born out of what seems to me a kind of improvisational uh, ongoing improvisation where nothing is determined purely in advance. Those certain habits get 
laid down and, and, and set and then things build upon those and build upon those. But it's a radical, ongoing improvisation, this cosmos and this biosphere. Yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm partly thinking of indigenous traditions and beliefs where it's understood that it's maybe not so much, I don't think they would necessarily say that, that they, they or anybody created the world through speech, mm. but they understand, like I'm not gonna say they believe in that patronizing world, those beliefs, like I would say they understand mm. that at least the world is maintained through exactly. speech and ritual and story. Yes. And, and if you That's stop so. telling the origin story, the world begins to dissolve. Right, right. Yeah. It's just for us in the, in the uh, alphabetized world of the West and modernity, um, when we hear a creation story, we think that it is actually trying to tell how the various things in the world um, came to be in some pure causal account. But most of the oral tradition stories, creation stories um, that are told again and again by oral tradition peoples, um, one has a sense that these stories are not in any way really trying to say this is literally how this came about or how that came into being, but the stories are uh, meant to articulate what is our right relation mm -hmm. to each of these presences or powers in the world that we now inhabit. And so the stories are about right relationship mm -hmm. and are a way of speaking the world that shows um, this beautiful uh, interplay of uh, respect, restraint, etiquette between mm -hmm. beings and between us and yeah. the rest of the world. Right, and you stop telling those stories and the world is gonna fall apart. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like, so, you know, and I just was thinking, ironically, we do the same thing. The dominant culture, we continually retell the story of the Big Bang. We tell the story of the founding fathers of America, you know. Yes. And if we stop telling these stories, then if not the world, at least society as we know it is going to fall apart. Like society depends on propagating these myths that are, are I mean, actually, I think really poisonous mm. to the soul. Mm. Um, and they maintain, help us maintain a world that no one actually wants to live in and that is destroying life. But, but the story basically denies life mm. already. That's right because it holds the world as dead. That's right. So we're creating exactly what the story is narrating. Yeah. Can I talk about magic? Sure. Okay, because... Um, Although, wait, okay. to, 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 <laughs> just to get there, yes. since you were using the word myth, let's just clarify for a moment, because um, I've heard you use it sometimes to say, you know, I mean, this is a myth. It's, 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 it's not true, it's balderdash. No, that's not what I mean by a myth. It's not that it's not true. Okay. Yeah. So. It's a, uh, a myth is a world maintaining story that um, tells us why we're here and what is. And, right. And so. And what is the right yeah. relation between things. Yeah. But so you're distinguishing between crummy myths. Yeah. Right. Or myths that actually um, are uh, uh, insulting mm -hmm. to the world as it now shows itself. Um, and, and yet there's a sense in which story or mythopoiesis is not something we can ever get behind to get to right. some um, um, you know, clear skeletal truth of what right. really is. No, it's myth or story in the richest sense is, is what we have. And it's right. about finding, finding the right story, a beautiful right. story, a luminous exactly. story. Yeah. yeah, a beautiful story. My orientation is mostly aesthetic. Mm -hmm. So, and there may have been a time like where the myth, like you were saying, like we think, we the modern mind think that we've gotten beyond myth, 
but it's actually just another myth. Yeah. This whole story of objective reality and, yes. and you know, invariance from the experimenter and, and all this kind of stuff, like the scientific method, et cetera, et cetera. It was maybe once upon a time a beautiful myth. Mm -hmm. Like it had a certain uh, economy to it, a certain elegance, and, yes. and it was from a certain place, from from where people were mm. at the time. It had a beauty to it, and things that were once beautiful can become no longer beautiful. Sure. So, and it's yeah. a story that denies its own mythic mm -hmm. uh, richness and. Um, and denies its um, inherence and embeddedness and rootedness within a world of story and myth and says, this alone is the true story, the real story. Right. Um, something we should always be wary of. Yes. That kind of certainty. Yeah. Right. Especially when it's not working very well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, for myself, I, I tend to um, be suspicious of certainty in any form, mm -hmm. um, working well or not. Um, mm -hmm. It's when folks are certain that, um, or certain that they're in cahoots with, uh, with the mandate of heaven, um, or are certain that this is the right way to think, or to speak, yeah. that... Um, I think then we have to take a lot of care mm -hmm. uh, and protect ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway. part of part of this myth is that change happens in the world through the exercise of force. This is basic Newtonian mechanics. If you don't exert a force, nothing changes. So we have technology, which is a highly elaborated system for the exercise of force mm. more and more precisely and with greater and greater energy. Yeah. And that's the way that the world is supposed to work. So in that uh, conception, there's this idea that magic, say like in Harry Potter or something like that, mm -hmm. it's simply an alternate unexplainable system for directing force. Like in Harry Potter, Instead of lifting something, you wave a wand and it gets lifted yes. through magical force. Yes. But I think that magic is something else entirely. As do I. And I think that is, so for those who do not know it, David was a, or was a professional magician. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we call it sleight of hand um, and uh, illusion. Um, and, and basically, there's this idea that it's not, quote, real magic. It's just tricks. But if you understand magic as not some other way of exerting force, but uh, the, the technology of the direction of attention, then you might be able to say it actually is real magic. And to take it even a step further... If the world does not only operate by force, but if attention is also a organizing principle of, of the world, then magic has a potency that doesn't depend on force. And we could get into synchronicity and all kinds of things like that, but, uh, but I'd like to just kind of offer this as an entree to take whatever direction you want um, mm -hmm. I would love to hear. I would love to hear your stories about. Just to put another thing into the mix. Um, well, your travels when you were got in over your head, and like that stuff's fascinating to me. When I was traveling as an itinerant magician, yeah, through um, Sri Lanka and Indonesia and Nepal. Um, but what do you say about magic? Um, opens the door to a really fruitful and, um, and wonder-filled uh, topos or topic. Um, just to say, I've never, ever thought of myself as an illusionist. Um, 
I got interested in the practice of sleight of hand magic because of uh, stargazing and the experience of utter wonderment um, that it brought me to and wanting to open that space of wonder now and then uh, in a manner that could be shared mm -hmm. with others. Um, so, and, and then traveled around, uh, well, I supported myself through college as a sleight of hand magician performing throughout New England and then traveled around North America um, as an itinerant sleight of hand magician. Eventually went to Europe, spent a year there, many wonderful adventures as a traveling magician. And then um, that was actually after my second year of college, then returned to college and then took off to Sri Lanka, to Indonesia, to Nepal, um, looking to meet the traditional magicians um, who practice their craft in the various rural backwater villages in Sri Lanka, um, in the islands of Java, um, at Bali, um, up in the Himalaya among the Sherpa people. Among the Sherpa they're called Dzankris. In Indonesia they're called Dukuns. Um, um, in the West now all of this goes by the name um, shaman or shamanism, but um, I tend to shy away from that term as well because it makes it sound like it's one thing. Mm -hmm. All these magicians are, are practicing the same shamanistic thing. Um, and it also, by being an ism, makes it sound like, okay, these shamanistic cultures, uh, the shaman is sort of at the center of the community and almost worshipped by the culture. And nothing could be mm -hmm. more different from the case that these folks are always at the margins of society. They're the oddballs. Um, they live not in the village, but way out beyond the edge of the village, usually just, you know, inside the forest edge or amid a cluster of wild boulders, places where the, the villagers, many of them would not even venture at night because they're too sakti or too powerful. But the magicians make their home there because it turns out that the magician's particular style of sentience or sensitivity is not, it doesn't really fit within or it's not circumscribed within a, the, the human um, constraints of uh, the culture or the human collective but rather it's places at the edge mediating between the human community and the more than human community of powers and beings by which I don't mean anything supernatural but just the community of other animals who walk and crawl and move through this terrain but also the fish who live in the waters in the rivers and lakes um, or in the islands of Indonesia, the, the, the fish and the whales and sea lions that inhabit the waters around those islands. But the flapping, swooping folks overhead, and, um, but not just the other animals, also the plants, all the rooted powers uh, within and around any com human community are assumed to be sentient, deeply animate, intelligent, but in a very different style and shape from our own kind of intelligence. But also, not just the animals and plants, but rocks, hillsides, boulders, the lichen on those boulders, um, dry riverbeds were assumed to have their own sensibility, winds and weather powers, mm -hmm. um, storm clouds, yes, but even words, we might say that we might speak. When we're not speaking them, they live off in their own villages um, and go about their own lives. Everything that we can sense was assumed to be a sentient, sensible presence. And the magicians are simply those folks who tend the boundary between human um, 
the human life, the human world, and the more than human world in which it's embedded, and are always practicing a kind of um, balancing the relation between the human collective and this much more than human field of um, sentience and relationship um, in which our lives are held or nested in a sense. So it seems to me that all magic and the practice of magic derives from, from such, um, from such a, a practice of, of, one could say, the ecological mediation of uh, tending the boundary between any human settlement and the larger ecology in which it's embedded. And, and um, can, can yeah. I just interject jump, something jump here? In, yeah. uh, you mentioned, you said, you're not talking about anything supernatural. Mm. And exactly. I think a notion of the supernatural becomes necessary when we reduce nature exactly. to much less than it really is. Exactly. Yet there are these phenomena that, that they, you know, we encounter them and because our story of nature, story of trees, story of water, story of rocks, cannot accommodate these phenomena, we call them supernatural, thereby de divorcing them from their true agents, which are all of the things you were, you were mentioning. Just so, I mean, yeah. just so. So today we encounter you know, the work of J.K. Rowling and Harry Potter, and magic here is, um, is entirely sort of supernatural. It's this other field of powers that we can call on to exert their um, motive force within the world of things and phenomena that we might call nature. But in a genuine um, understanding of magic and where this whole sensibility that, we, that has the flavor that we call magic comes from is it's simply the experience of living in a world that is itself alive through and through where every facet every being has its own interior animation its own pulse its own rhythm or way in the world okay but i want to explore this with you because okay. my my intuition mm. my instinct even is that um what you were doing as an itinerant magician even though you yourself didn't know it, you were actually doing something very akin to what these, what were they called? Uh, Dukuns and Dukuns Zankris. and Zankris yes. were doing mm -hmm. in, in a similar way to, to how our entire modern civilization doesn't know that it's actually engaging the power of ritual uh, and myth to produce the wonders that it produces. Uh, it actually is doing the same thing ultimately that all human beings have ever done. So there you are. So so okay. So we have these these um, these dukus and dukuns, yeah, dukuns and and what are they? Zakris, zankris, zankris. These dukuns and zankris, uh, healing people and and doing whatever they're doing. And here you are hiding a coin up your sleeve, or whatever you're doing. So I want to I want to somehow develop the the deep connection because they recognized you as doing something that like they didn't like how did they respond to you and and is there a thread here that I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to follow a thread that mm. wants to unite what you were doing with the direction of attention and stuff like that. Um, with what these, pra these traditional practitioners were doing? Well, let me help unpack this a little yeah. bit then. Um, from my own angle, or from my own admittedly goofy perspective, what, um, what magicians are engaged in, whether they are... Um, traditional indigenous sorcerers or contemporary sleight of hand conjurers is we all work with the very malleable texture of perception or of sensory experience. Uh, 
uh, the activity of our eyes, of our ears, of our skin. You said that your basic perspective is aesthetic. Um, well, aesthesis just means the activity of the senses, the work mm -hmm. of the senses. And um, so my basic uh, uh, approach to the world is entirely also aesthetic. And we're brothers in this way. Um, the, the magician is uh, an adept or someone who is awake to how uh, malleable, how fluid and shape-shifting sensory experience really is. Um, when a person falls ill um, or, or deeply sick, it's uh, in traditional cultures generally understood uh, as um, a kind of stuck uh, set of holding patterns that the person falls into. Um, sometimes it's spoken of as uh, a possession, that a demon or a malevolent spirit has taken hold of some part of, of, of the person. And in fact, what I was doing when I was traveling in, uh, through Southeast Asia, the, using sometimes sleight of hand uh, techniques to work um, these kind of astonishments for people, was not just akin to, it turns out that sleight of hand, which I didn't realize until that journey, has its origin in the work of these um, shamans and dukuns and zankris who use sleight of hand to engage the stuck static holding patterns that a particular organism or person might be gripped by, by speaking directly through her eyes or through her ears and her skin by going by way of the senses to startle the person out of that stuck mm -hmm. pattern. Um, today, a, um, a sleight of hand conjurer, or at least I'll speak for myself, my own craft with uh, sleight of hand, is, is to take uh, an object and begin to coax a person uh, into paying a closer and closer attention to this object and then have it do something that is utterly unexpected uh, and, and strange and um, well-nigh impossible. In doing this, a magician is loosening and actually it's a, sometimes a kind of shock therapy to just startle the senses out of these stuck, static, um, yeah, holding patterns, ways of seeing that are so endlessly reiterated and deadening of the world that we experience so that people actually start seeing again, actually start hearing this, the voices of a much more than human conversation again. So when I'm performing, or when I was performing professionally, um, working, I was house magician at Alice's Restaurant in um, the Berkshires of Massachusetts, that storied um, mm -hmm. um, institution called Alice's Restaurant. And I would work just going from table to table doing these sort of minor miracles for people. And um, over the course of 45 minutes or an hour, a, a sort of web of fascination would be spun within this whole dining room so that everyone was aware of which table I was working at, but they were all just very, very attentive. Um, and I would work usually three hours a night with, with a break somewhere in it. But at at least one point in uh, an evening or an afternoon when I was performing, some people who had then left, they had finished their meal or their cocktails and had left the establishment, would come back in, or one member um, uh, would come back in, wait patiently for when I was um, stopping working at, at one table, and would come up to me and say, what did you do? What did you do? We walked outside, and all of the leaves on the trees were all like looking at us. 
what's going on? Or all of the grasses are just sparkling in yeah. the ground. Because what had happened, what the sleight of hand does when it's done well, is it wakes up the senses. It just startles them awake, so we actually start seeing again creatively. Mm -hmm. um, and that's deeply akin to uh, the craft of the dukun, of the dzankri, of any traditional medicine person or healer. It really interrupts, one way I, I think of it is it, it interrupts the way that I narrate the world to myself, because right. here's this thing that just doesn't fit into the story of, of, mm. of how things happen, what happens. Right. You know, it's like a total anomaly. So it breaks, and, it breaks the story. And if, and if we're yeah. all inhabiting and sort of um, holding an existence by our ways of speaking, a really shitty story, yeah. um, it's, it's a powerful way to just interrupt it again right. and again. So, so and one way you can maintain the story is by saying, oh, well, actually what you were doing was just with the emphasis on the word just, right. was just this. And that's an attempt to bring it back into the story that I'm already holding, mm -hmm. which might be why magicians famously do not divulge their tricks. Because then you're, if you div divulge like the mechanistic procedure by which you did it, you are uh, capitulating to that person's attempt to maintain their existing story. Indeed, but there's, there's much more to unpack of this, which we don't have to do can, here. Can I say one more? Yeah, I, yeah, please. Because like, I just want to say it totally works on me. I'm a sucker for magic. Mm. I, I visited a, a distant relative, this is a number of years ago, and he does, um, he's really good with card tricks, you know? Mm. And like you think that you know kind of how they work, but he did one, you know, where I pick a card, you know, and I stick it back in the deck and remember it, you know, and then, then go through the deck again, it's not mm. there. And then he calls his wife from the kitchen and he says, could you bring in the card that's sitting on the kitchen table? And that's the card. Right. Like, how did that happen? You know, it's like the mind just reels before this, this flagrant exception to the way that I've been acculturated to yes, see the exactly. world. Um, yeah. Well, a couple things to say. One is you're not a sucker. Um, <laughs> well, I like being a sucker, but... That's, that's the... Um, yeah. No, the real suckers are those who will watch something impossible and will say, oh, I've seen that before. My uncle used to do that. Mm. Uh, um, yeah, yeah, I know there are wires there, right? And they're always imagining all sorts of weird workings um, behind the scenes as a way to just avoid letting go into mm. the pleasure of losing oneself. Mm -hmm. and losing one's story for a moment. The secret is that any magician worthy of her salt or his salt is, um, um, of which there are not, alas, all that many in uh, the modern context um, where the vast majority of magicians, 98, 99% of folks who call themselves magicians in the West, think of themselves as illusionists, which is to say they don't even believe in magic. They are trying to create the illusion of something magical because for them as well, real magic doesn't exist. So the idea that these folks are magicians is, is kind of ridiculous. Um, any magician worthy of his salt is someone who is not um, engaged in a mechanical um, um, conjuring of an illusion, but is deeply given to the wonder of the real and has apprenticed to it, as it were, and is um, looking for the very same astonishment and is trying to, with his eyes and her ears and senses trying to feel toward and slip toward that very same moment of wonder mm. that anybody watching will experience. If I'm not captured by uh, the dance of the coin as it rolls over my fingers and then it vanishes and it's gone, if it's not vanished for me, 
there's no way it's going to be really mm -hmm. managed for you. Um, so it's uh, the deep yeah. magician is one who is himself or herself uh, caught, as it were, um, by this um, mm -hmm. ongoing production of wonder that we call the present moment. Okay, so I want to take this in two directions at the okay. same time. Okay. Maybe I'll lay them both out and mm. you can see what appeals. One is just on a political level, uh, the operation of magic, uh, maybe you could call it black magic, to mm. hold people in mm. a confining story through the direction of attention, through the manipulation of narratives, mm. uh, through the willful exclusion of, yeah. of data points that would induce wonder um, and the exclusion of anything that violates the story and the power structures that uh, co-resonate with that story. Mm -hmm. There's, in, in, in a, a very real sense, reality, like political reality, social reality, economic reality, yeah. The reality that affects people's lives in tangible ways is maintained through essentially magical uh, techniques. And the other thing that I'm, I'm mm. sensing there might be a connection here. You were talking about 98, 99% of magicians don't even believe in magic. Right. And I've noticed that some of the most vociferous debunkers mm -hmm. of anything that doesn't fit into consensus scientific reality are professional magicians. Mm -hmm. uh, most famously, James Randi. Yeah. Uh, just, but going back to Harry Houdini, you know, he was, he was a, a very uh, aggressive debunker of anything supernormal, anything mysterious. Um, well, yeah, but and, let's recognize that, so Harry Houdini, who was a consummate magician, mm -hmm. um, got into that because he was, um, he was deeply given to mystery mm -hmm. and to the mysterious and the wondrous uh, of the world. He was also very close to his Jewish mother. And when she passed on, he was aching to be able to communicate with her. Mm. Um, and so uh, went and consulted and did sessions with um, with some spirit mediums and discovered to his horror and shock that this was all, at least those he was encountering, right. were uh, engaged in just bald fakery. Mm -hmm. uh, and they didn't realize that they were with Harry Houdini, who would, of course, see through anything like that. Um, and so he was, yes, he became and was sort of the first uh, professional magician who became a sort of arch debunker, yeah. but he was debunking in hopes of uh, encountering and discovering the real thing. Yeah, um, I, I sense that among the de debunkers, there's a secret hope that they won't be able to debunk something. Yeah. I'm, and they uh, want certainty, though. Like yeah, but, uh, but I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm going to say that, no, Randy, I've locked horns with Randy, mm -hmm. um, in the past a couple times, and he's on the far end of the spectrum mm -hmm. of, of magicians. I don't think he has any interest in encountering uh, a mystery that he can't debunk. Um, and the same with many others, you know, who will remain nameless right now, who are out making their way in the world by um, exposing everything marvelous as really just a trick. So I would not associate that. With well, the phrase that is coming to me is, thou doth protest too much. Like the fact that they're so intent mm. on debunking it and, mm. and maintaining a mechanical universe yes. leads me to think that there's some kind of psychology going on there. Like why are they so, so doctrinaire and so attached to it? Well, it does... And in the hands of many who get to call themselves magicians, there is a kind of will to power, mm -hmm. uh, which is a will to power over mm -hmm. and a will to control and an impulse to control or have 
the, the world, as it were, under your belt because you can explain it, you can, um, which is a kind of microcosm of the madness of our contemporary civilization. But I'm just not going to call these folks magicians, and okay. I don't. They are uh, tricksters of a sort, but not very coyote-like uh -huh. uh, in their trickery. They are... Um, illusionists mm -hmm. as they see themselves um, and I am not of that camp mm -hmm. um, at all. The very notion of illusion leans upon, depends upon the idea that there is a, a world, a true world, a true reality that is utterly fixed, determinate, um, Independent of our stories and our conversations and our relationships. Yes, it's just a, a world of sheer facts. Right. And then whatever is not of, of that world um, is illusory, is an illusion, rather than a sense that reality itself is a play, a dance of a rich, wild, improvisational relationship between things, between beings. Um, in which things are continually uh, arising and then shape-shifting into something else where everything, as it were, is crouched in readiness to mm -hmm. become something else mm -hmm. uh, at the next moment. That's a very different sense of reality. And one who holds that can't really um, engage with the notion of illusion right. because the world itself is such a shape-shifting Dance. Yeah, and we're seeing this in public affairs now where the illusions that are created become reality or they change reality. Like, the, like for example, just very mundanely, the way that the media portrays something yeah. influences profoundly the thing that is being portrayed. Yeah. And you can no longer hold the idea of, a, say, a journalist reporting on the facts. The yeah. reportage itself changes the facts. Mm. So... Right what does truth become when you can't pin it to objective facts? Right. And the postmodern response is, well, there is no such thing as truth. It's a cultural construct. But I, that's not a satisfying answer to me. Um, well, also because they would say that it's, yes, a cultural construct or uh, a social construction. But the problem is they the society that generates this social construction isn't exclusively human. Um, if one opens that, that creative society, relational, uh, collective, onto the other animals, mm -hmm. the plants, gravity, rainfall, um, then yes, each thing is a social construction. It's born of right. this interplay within this huge, more than human community of beings. Um, but that it's all a construct of human, um, of the human mind uh, um, yeah. dancing with itself, that's a very unfortunate. That's just another, it's actually in a way not postmodern at all. It's just no. another version of, you know, humans, lords and masters of the world manipulating a dead universe. And it's, very very yeah. much so, Yeah, very much so. I'd agree with that. Yeah, I mean, there was something, um, uh, Charles gave a lovely talk the other day that I was, uh, that I was able to, to hear most of. I got in a bit late. Um, there was something you said in response to a question that came from, from the audience um, where you spoke of, well, there are the... Um, uh, the ritual gestures, the ceremonies, the um, stories that uh, animate and inform um, traditional and indigenous cultures the world over. And you said, you said, I tend to take these stories at face value. Um, and I thought that was that was interesting. Surely there is something to be taken 
uh, one has to listen and, and hear and respect what is there on the face of these stories. But I wanted to ask, and this um, jives very closely with what we've just been speaking of. Um, for me, I'm, I'm not sure I take these uh, understandings of the world all at face value in that I don't take any of them literally, just as I don't take any of the stories of my own culture uh, very literally. It seems to me that literal truth is an artifact of literacy, and hence is very, very recent. Um, and I am always looking for a deeper kind of truth, experiential, sensorial, mm -hmm. full-bodied, uh, ringing truth. Um, it's neither literal on the one hand, nor on the other hand, oh, it's just a metaphor. That's just metaphoric. So with, I'm leaping here, but with writing and alphabetic literacy in particular, comes this split of suddenly there's the literal truth. Is that true to the letter of scripture? Is it true to the letter of the law? That's what literal originally meant. And then it got projected, as it were, onto the world. And so right. I can be speaking and uh, someone can stand up and object and say, Abram, you know, give me a break. Do you mean to say that that rock literally spoke to you? To which I have to reply, no, it didn't literally speak to me, but it spoke to me. Um, I'm after... A, a style of truth that is deeper than literal truth prior to the split between the literal on the one hand and the metaphoric on the other. Sometimes I call it not metaphoric, but metamorphic truth, mm -hmm. shape-shifting truth. Um, like to say that the world is alive is far more than a metaphor. Um, but it would be unfortunate if we take it to just be, you know, something literal. It's, um, it's much deeper. Yep. It's much more profound to say that, the, that we live within a breathing planet. Um, okay, well, we breathe. So you mean metaphorically that the planet... Well, obviously, that's much more than just a metaphor because our breathing is part of this whole exquisite physiological you know, exchange wherein what us animals breathe out is what all the plants breathe in. And what all the plants are breathing out is what all us animals breathe in. And so talk about reciprocity. And then the soils are participant and the oceans are participant. It's breathing in a much richer sense. And our breathing is a part of that. Um, so I'm always looking for what's more than mm -hmm. just metaphoric. It's metamorphic. Right. It's, uh, it speaks to the shape-shifting magic of the real. So for me, just to bring this full circle, magic, far from being something supernatural, as it's so commonly taken, is, is, is basically nature itself. It's not supernature, it's nature itself. When we are experiencing it from our fully embodied embedded position in the depths of this blooming, buzzing mysterium we call nature, or that I refer to as the more than human world. It's from within its depths. Nature at every point is magical. That is, it is, uh, it is bursting with mystery and wonder and the logic that courses through it is a curvilinear logic where things curve back on themselves over and again and touch off other curvilinear movements. It's not a linear, straight line, right angle um, kind of causality, which is how nature displays itself when we pretend to look at it, sometimes for good purposes, as though from outside from a disembodied um, God's eye view from nowhere. Um, looked at from outside, things can seem to follow this very uh, linear 
unilinear right angle kind of causality. But from within, when we return to our fully embodied animal presence in the thick of nature as just one of its organisms, one of its creatures, so different from the spider and so different from the hummingbird uh, who know things about the world that we can't possibly because their senses are so different from ours. And yet, I am a variant of that hummingbird. I'm a variant of that aspen grove. It's um, from that position, magic is just a, a fine way of speaking of the imminent sacredness or holiness mm -hmm. of the real in its wonder. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it would definitely be uh, a strange thing to say that I took literally something that comes from a non-literate culture. But I didn't say that. I said, right. I take it at face value. Exactly, yeah. And I can say that I, I could say that about um, things that seem contradictory that I take them all at face value. Sure. Um, and I like that. I don't yeah. know if I, if I excavated what I really mean by face value. It might come down to something about um, a face, you know, mm. and right. how something presents itself. Yeah. And what, what I really meant by it is that I don't try to reduce it or translate it into exactly. you know, the modern mechanistic worldview. So for example, if the, uh, if, if the Hopi or the Diné or Zuni say that the, this is a famous example from, I can't remember where it's from, but it's, if they say that the, uh, that the uh, prairie dogs call the rain, I'm not gonna say, well, what they really mean is that their, their tunnels um, allow rainwater to penetrate and then it, <laughs> da, 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 and it you Goodness. know, the evaporation and this and that and other thing. That's what they really meant, mm -hmm. you know, to reduce it, to say, to, to take the, to first of all, see it as just metaphor for something real mm -hmm. that is real in the story of the world that I grew up in. Right. Like that's, that's what I, you know, Beautiful. and instead, instead I'll, I'll be like, okay, let's look at the world from, this perspective, right? And I do this, you know. I'm, I'm also um, I like to play with various uh, shadow realities, I call them, or parallel world stories. So there's the standard one of of history and archaeology, and then there's a parallel story that has Atlantis and things like that, and mm -hmm. uh, another parallel story that has extraterrestrial you know, xenopolitical elements in it. And there's the story of, of the standard story of 9-11, and then there's an alternative story and another alternative story and all these different mm. uh, conflicting stories. And, and the, the training that I received in this society is to find the one that's real, to find the one that's true, okay. the one that's actually true. And where I've gone, you know, instead, is to accept each of these as a lens yeah. through which to see the world and ask, what does it reveal? What does it hide? Nice. And who do I become looking through this lens? Because it's not just a separate observer putting on a different pair of binoculars. Yes. Like you become the lens to some extent. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, that makes beautiful sense to me, and I think is a right is a right on way of engaging these stories. And it's the only way I know how to engage with mm -hmm. it once I countenance the the idea that that reality isn't this fixed thing outside of myself. Mm -hmm. If if the elements of reality are stories and relationships, then how do I navigate this? Right. The apparatus I was that I've inherited in this culture is useless. Right. And, and you know, some of these, and, and so I, I see that there's a growing uh, consciousness of the non-objective relational nature of reality. I mean, even our words get us, get us in a mess. Sure. Like here I am using the word reality as if it's this thing, not to denigrate thing, but that's another conversation. So, so, I think this leaves people susceptible to what I call totalizing discourses mm. where they take one of these lenses yes. 
and it's maybe an alternative to the lens that was induced in them by the culture, and they see everything through that lens. So it could be the lens of race and privilege, or the lens of capitalism, and you know, or the lens of, of, you know, some maybe new age spiritual lens, or the conspiracy lens, or right. you know, or to take one or another traditional culture and say, well, that they had the reality. Right. You know, this is how it is. Yeah, exactly. And it's we see that happen so yeah. often. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, I want to say that that there is a way to respect the world views of another culture without replacing that as you know as my literal truth. Right. Like to take it at face value and to respect it, not in the sense of well, let's be you know patronizingly tolerantly respectful of these backward worldviews but we really know better, but we'll respect them anyway because they were, right? But to actually um, try it on and, and yeah, and again, just, just to what can I see? What no longer makes sense? What um, do I know is important that I can no longer see that becomes invisible? What does it make invisible? What does it make visible? And who do I become? That's good. Yeah. I. I wonder if this would resonate with you. Um, I think, for myself, I think I've, t I've taken up what could be called a sort of a pragmatist uh, relation to many such stories and ways of speaking and belief systems. That is, um, it seems to me that there are some ways of speaking, many, many different ones, and necessarily different in different places. Uh, ways of speaking, or stories, one could say, but that a way of speaking that holds the people there in right relation to that land. Um, and that's what I'm looking for, mm -hmm. is what are the ways of speaking that hold me and hold others around me in a, a fruitful, reciprocal relation with the more than human earth, such that we are not radically impeding the ability of the animate landscape to replenish itself and continually come to exuberant health. Mm -hmm. um, so it does seem to me that there are um, some ways of speaking um, that have become endemic to uh, the modern world and to the scientistic discourse that some people wield um, that actually frustrate and interrupt even the possibility of a right relation mm -hmm. to the living land. I mean, a civilization that recklessly wrecks its groundwater, its air, its breath, um, the soils, is not well acquainted with truth, regardless of you know, how many supposed facts and measurable quantitative um, uh, data points it has amassed uh, about the, the, the quantifiable, measurable qualities of its world, it's not well acquainted with truth. If one takes truth to be an index of right relation with the real. So I, maybe I don't take um, all stories at face value, but I'm always listening for, is this a way of speaking that if I took up this way of speaking, I would come into a more uh, fluid relation mm -hmm. with the rest of the real. And by and large, uh, many of the tales, practices, understandings of 
traditional indigenous peoples seem to have that kind of truth. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, what has been called in other quarters uh, a pragmatist take mm -hmm. on truth. That is, truth is what works. And what works for me is what holds us in a right relation to the real and its wonder. Yeah. And I would just add to that. Uh, what works, you know, in, in, in the climate book, I, I talked about, the, I talked, you know, a general principle is that we're not asking the right questions. Um, it's not that we don't have the right answers. So we don't have the right questions. So one of the questions is, uh, that is the wrong question, is how do we survive? Um, mm. How do we create a sustainable civilization? And I think the right question is what kind of world do we want to live in? Right. So as far as what works, if you have a conception of what works, that means human beings uh, continuing on earth in large numbers, living longer lifespans, having higher literacy, having higher GDP, et cetera, et cetera, right. then our current trajectory actually might work. You talk about poisoning the groundwater, poisoning the air, that's okay. David, we can have uh, air filters and right. water filters and bubble cities, right. and we don't need nature. And this idea that we're going to be rescued from that trajectory by it not working, because uh, we're going to start dying and we're not going to achieve the objective of human survival. I feel like that's a dangerous delusion. Like, what if we don't get r rescued? What if we can create a dead world and live in it? And yeah. so for me, it's a question of, as far as what works, like I would, the way I interpret that is like, is what works in the sense of, being in alignment with who I really want to become, who I really want to be, the kind of world I want to live in, yeah. is it consistent with that? It's a matter of consistency and coherence. Uh huh. Sure. I yeah. think I think we're saying much the same thing. I deeply agree with what you say. The only world I have deep interest in is a world where not just humans, but many yeah. other shapes of sensitivity and sentience are out and about and afoot in the land, not just those that we have genetically engineered uh, yeah. for our purposes. Um, and people don't have yeah. those experiences, but, but in the book I mentioned like this experience, I think, of, of swimming with some seals mm. in Scotland, and they're just, they're so curious, you know, and they pop up their head, you know, and they come and check mm. you out, and I know you have experiences with seals, and and like, Sea lions, yeah. And sea lions. And I'm, I'm like, how could anybody have this experience and not want to live in a world with seals? Right. right. Like, how important is that? But right. if you are immersed in a world, to, guess, to return to our original yeah. topic, if you're immersed in a world of, of data and computer models of climate in 50 years, and mm. like you don't have that sensory connection to seals, like it's just, you're in a world of data, you're in a world of abstraction. And seeing through data and abstraction, it makes sense that you will value the things that can be abstracted and quantified. Like you're in that universe. You're in it, it's hard to see how you're getting much juice from it. Um, so even, you know, the brothers and sisters who are caught in those spaces, um, I just have to believe, if their hearts are still beating, that they, you know, when they leave the office, uh, they're still glorying in the taste of the air, you know, and the blue of the sky or a night sky overhead mm -hmm. where actually a few stars are glimmering through the city smog. But um, it's true that so many of our fellow citizens are. Uh, invoking, without realizing it one senses, but are invoking um, a future that is by their actions they are setting into place a course that can um, only lead to a future in which we're living in domed cities, right. completely air-conditioned, when outside the domes it's just wasteland right. and uh, resource wars. Um, and that seems to be the future that 
um, our civilization is right now hell bent right. on, on, on reaching. And you um, use the word invoke here, so yeah. that returns us to magic and, and how we are maybe yeah. many, many of us magicians in the invocation yes. of a different yes. future. And if I may say, you're speaking of the seals and the encounter with some seals popping up in the waters around you. Um, we were speaking of, ma of magic from different angles, but m for me, it's always been the heart of the heart of the heart of magic mm -hmm. is simply the encounter with another shape mm -hmm. of sentience, radically different from my own. Um, I mean, in a sense, it's a great magic to encounter another person who is already in so many ways different from yeah. me, as, as you are, different trajectory, born in a different place, different style, and yet the encounter with someone from a very different culture, the encounter with someone from a very different species. Mm -hmm. Wow, you know, how does the world look to you, taste to you? And let's compare notes in whatever way we can, just by hanging out or playing with one another. Um, yeah. And yet it's the same world that you, sea lion, are experiencing and that I'm experiencing from two radically different angles. Or the world that a clump of sagebrush mm -hmm. is experiencing is the same one that I'm experiencing and yet it's, it's engaging it, uh, nuancing it, so weirdly different from my own experience. So um, to me that is the nub of magic one could say, the heart of all magic, and I would say of traditional medicine people or magicians, is interspecies communication. Mm -hmm. uh, the ability to leap across the gap uh, between worlds, between radically different forms of, or of otherness, or the encounter with the other, the encounter with with the strangeness of another being mm -hmm. who is just as present as I am, but in a radically different style and shape and form. Yeah. 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 I think maybe we should uh, yeah. end with that. That was beautiful. Mm.